This week we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, page 961, if you're using one of the Bibles in the bench in front of you. Uh, This is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. Uh, The Apostle Paul writes to correct some some problems in the church, uh, some very kind of practical problems towards the beginning of the letter, some some problems having to do with um, their conduct and their behavior, uh, which some of, some of which is very alarming. Um, he corrects some problems they're having in terms of worship uh, and, and how their worship services are being conducted and, and the exercise of certain spiritual gifts. And now in chapter 15, he is preparing to correct um, a problem with their belief. It's not that they don't believe the gospel. They believe the gospel. But some of the implications of the gospel, uh, they have not fully worked out yet in their understanding. Uh, And so in verses 1 through 11, the Apostle Paul is going to remind the Corinthians of the gospel, which they have heard and have embraced and believed. So let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary... I worked harder than any of them, and though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me, whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. Let's pray. (coughs) Father, uh, we are grateful for your word. We pray that you would remind us of your gospel once again. Father, we pray that being reminded of it, Uh, We will continue to be changed by it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, Repetition can really do a couple of things in us. Familiarity can, can dull our sensitivity to a message, to a work of art. You can look at a painting so many times and see it in books and on coffee mugs and in posters that you really lose a sense of the genius that the work represents. I mean, who can honestly say that they haven't seen painting of water lilies so many times that it just looks like background static to us at some point, right? But repetition can do something else. It can cause a deeper love and appreciation in us. For me, it's not Monet's water lilies. It's uh, Christmas Vacation Age, right? (laughs) Which we watch at our house every December uh, with our older kids, not our younger kids. Uh, But the more times I watch that movie, the more I love that movie. This is how the gospel should affect us. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and in chapter 15 he says, I would remind you of the gospel, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are being saved. The Apostle Paul is reminding the Corinthians of something they've already heard, they've already understood, that they've already embraced, and yet he finds it necessary to remind them. Repetition, reminders, reinforce the message so that it can be at the top of our minds, can bear fruit in our lives, can grow in us a deeper appreciation for the message. 
Every Christian needs to be reminded of the gospel, the good news about Jesus, which we have heard and which we believe. There's no more important message to believe, no more important message to receive, to remember than the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we remember the gospel, what is it that we are to remember? Well, the Apostle Paul unpacks it for us. It's only a handful of verses, but it's rich with detail and with meaning. First of all, the gospel is the main thing for Christians... And it's what the whole Bible is about. Those are two things that we have to keep in mind. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about Jesus, who he is and what he did, his life, his death, his resurrection. This is the main thing for Christians. And it's what the whole Bible is about. In verse 3, the Apostle Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. When he says fallen asleep, he means they died. The Apostle Paul rehearses the basic outline of the gospel truths about Jesus and says, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. The gospel is of first importance for Christians. It is the main thing. It's important for Christians to know that all of our doctrinal convictions grow out of our best understanding of the scriptures. And we believe the scriptures are the word of God himself. So it's important for you guys to know that at Grace Central, we are not a doctrinally minimalist church. If you're new to Grace Central, this is important for you to know. Some churches are doctrinally minimalist. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not what we are. Some churches, if you ask for their statement of faith, you might have like uh, one page with 11 bullet points of things they believe. That's fine, right? But at Grace Central, we actually are in a tradition that's doctrinally maximalist. We hold to a confession of faith called the Westminster Confession, which was written in 16, completed in 1647. It's got a larger catechism and a shorter catechism. And if there's a thing to have an opinion about... Presbyterians got, got an opinion about it, right? We are doctrinally maximalist. And we believe that doctrine, the teachings of Scripture, we believe they're important. If God put it in Scripture, he did it on purpose. And so we should study it. And we should try our best to understand it and apply it to our thoughts and to our lives. And all doctrinal convictions are important. And all doctrinal convictions have consequences in our lives. Listen. All doctrinal convictions for Christians are important, but they are not equally important. They all have consequences in our lives and in our souls, but they don't have equal consequences in our lives and in our souls. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a matter of first importance for Christians. There are lots of things, lots of doctrinal matters that Christians might disagree on. There's a lot a person can get wrong and still be a true Christian. Are the days of creation in Genesis chapter 1 24-hour days or are they something else? The New Testament talks about predestination and election. How does that work? Should we baptize our babies or should we only baptize those who are old enough to give a credible profession of faith. When does the return of Jesus happen in relationship to other events we read about in the book of Revelation? What's the millennium of Revelation chapter 20? What's really happening when we take the Lord's Supper? All of these questions are important. All of these beliefs have consequences in our lives, but none of them are of first importance. There is a lot Christians might disagree on. There's a lot a person can get wrong and still be a true Christian. But this, the gospel, is not one of them. If we get this wrong, we've gotten everything wrong. Our belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ is our unity as Christians of all different stripes and different traditions and all around the world worshiping in different languages in different places, in different centuries. 
It's our conviction that these things about Jesus are true. That is our unity. The gospel is the main thing for Christians. The gospel is also what the whole Bible is about. If you look at verses 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The apostle Paul uses repetition of that phrase in accordance with the scriptures so that his readers can be certain that what he's saying about Jesus has been foreshadowed, predicted, foretold in the Old Testament. The gospel of Jesus Christ is what the whole Bible is about. After the resurrection, Jesus appeared to his followers. And while he's with them, he helps them to understand. Luke chapter 24, verses 26, he says to them, Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, saying Moses and the prophets, that's shorthand for whole Old Testament, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus, after the resurrection, Jesus walked his friends through the Old Testament and showed all the things that were pointing to him. The gospel is what the whole Bible is about. Luke chapter 24, verses 44 and following. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Again, Jesus walks his friends through the Old Testament and shows them that everything they just witnessed, his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, it was all foretold in the pages of the Old Testament. The gospel is what the whole Bible is about. The clues were always there, but were a hidden mystery that was revealed only when Jesus came. In Romans chapter 16, the Apostle Paul calls it the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all the nations. He says that's the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the main thing for Christians. It's the thing of first importance. It's the thing we must not get wrong. The gospel that Jesus came, that he died for our sins, that he was raised from the grave. It's simple enough that children can have an adequate understanding of it. But the whole of the Old and the New Testaments are about the gospel and unpack the gospel so that scholars can spend their entire career studying it and still only scratch the surface of its glories. Some will attempt to undermine your faith. Some will attempt to erode your confidence in the truth of the gospel by pitting the Bible against itself. It's important for you to know that. Some will say, well, the God of the Old Testament is very different than the God of the New Testament. He's not. They'll say Jesus taught some things that were very different than the Apostle Paul taught, and so we'll pit Jesus against the Apostle Paul. They'll say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give vastly different testimonies of the life of Jesus and his death and resurrection. It's important for you to know that the Bible is a unity. Yeah, diverse authors written over centuries in different contexts, different genres. Some of it's poetry, some of it's historical writing, some of it is letters. But all of it together presents a fundamental unity. The whole thing is about the gospel of Jesus Christ, looking forward to and foreshadowing and foretelling the coming of Jesus, unpacking the significance of Jesus and what he said and what he did, or looking back at what he said and what he did and applying that for our lives now and, and, and showing us the implications for it. But all of it has Jesus and his gospel at its center. The gospel is the main thing and the gospel is what the whole Bible is about. Secondly, the gospel is about an, an, an historical event with theological meaning. It's an historical event with theological meaning. 
It's a historical event. What we mean is that when the Apostle Paul says that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, we mean that he's describing something that really happened. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not religious myth. It's not spiritual allegory. The scriptures themselves insist on this interpretation. In verses 3 through 8, the Apostle Paul states very clearly what the gospel means, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, then he appeared to James and the rest of the apostles, and finally appeared to Paul himself. The Apostle Paul is listing eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus. He even goes out of his way to state, out of the 500, many of them are still alive. Some have passed away, but most of them are still alive. People who would be able to refute the details of the resurrection if it in fact was not true. If it did not happen. The value of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not simply in being a very good story although it's a very good story. It's not a powerful religious allegory about forgiveness and, and new beginnings or some such thing. The reason the gospel of Jesus Christ is of first importance is because it really happened. Look at verses 14. We're jumping ahead to where we'll be next week, but we've got to look at this. Look at, look at verses 14 and following. The Apostle Paul says, If Christ has not been raised then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. <coughs> Pardon me. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. The Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthians, people, I'm saying it really happened, and if it didn't happen, then let's all go home. We can find other things to do on a Sunday morning. The gospel is about historical events that really happened, but they're historical events with theological meaning. This man, Jesus, these events, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, they mean something. They tell us something about God, and they tell us something about us. They tell us that we right, have sins, that we are in, in the guilt of our sin, and that unless God did something to intervene, we would, <coughs> we would die in our sins. Sin is our spiritual and moral failure. We're born into it. We sin because we're sinners. Sin causes a disruption in our relationship with God. Sin, sin brings death to us, spiritual death. In John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Because of sin, we are not free as we were created to be free, but we're enslaved to sin. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. But Ephesians chapter 2 maybe describes it most clearly. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In the events of Jesus' life, God was doing something for us to rescue us. He sent Jesus when the, when the time was right in, in the history of the world. He brought Jesus into the world, the God-man, to bear the guilt of our sins in his death so that we might receive forgiveness and be raised up to new life, to be made alive spiritually and to share in the glory of Jesus himself. The gospel is about historical events 
that have theological, spiritual significance and meaning. Some will tell you that life only has meaning as we create meaning for ourselves in life. That we must, must find that meaning for ourselves. That we seek out, this is my truth. Have you heard that phrase? There's a musician who was previously a Christian, a Christian musician. He made worship albums, he was nominated for Grammys, and this week he tweeted this, Jesus was Christ, Buddha was Christ, Muhammad was Christ. Christ is a word for the universe seeing itself. You are Christ, we are the body of Christ. Man, the gospel and God's own interpretation of the events of the gospel, which he gives us in scripture, frees us from this kind of... Uh, it's ridiculous. Christ is the universe seeing itself? Okay, Christ is the universe seeing itself. You are the Christ. So you, you are the universe seeing itself, and we are the body of Christ, so... The universe seeing itself is the body of the universe seeing itself? What are you talking about? The simple facts of the gospel message, interpreted by scripture itself, frees us from that kind of nonsense. I'm not mocking. It isn't funny. The guy is in mortal danger. But the gospel is the main thing for Christians. It really happened, and God has told us what it means. Our lives find meaning in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We take our place in the story, very literally, when we embrace Christ so that we become sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus. What it, what it means is that you are loved by the God who created you, that you are valued by the God who created you, that you are loved and valued to the degree that he, he, he did not rest content to let you go to your grave in, in alienation from him. But he provided a way for you to be reunited with him, to establish a relationship with him, and he did it by sending Christ himself to die in your place so that you could become his son or his daughter, so that you can be saved from your sins, saved from damnation after death, yes, but also rescued from the chaos that sin is creating in your life now. Rescued from all the damage that selfishness and sin and rebellion is creating in your heart and in your spirit now. So that you can become more who it is that God created you to be. Through embracing the gospel, through being rescued from sin, you become more yourself, not less. In the gospel we discover the meaning which God has written into the universe. And thirdly, the gospel requires us to receive it and to stand in it, both. First, to receive it, we see there in verse 1, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel which I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. There is for every Christian, there must be a receiving of the gospel. At some point, you must hear the gospel. He says, the gospel I preached to you. You must hear the gospel, you must understand the gospel, and you must receive it by believing it. Some will say that you must remember the day that you first believed. I don't know if any of you grew up in those kinds of churches. You have to know the day and the time and the place that you first believed. <coughs> They'll say, you have to ask Jesus into your heart. Look, that kind of stuff just creates anxiety for Christians, okay? What you must do is believe the gospel. What you must do is trust Jesus. Can, can you not remember the first time you believe? Okay, do you believe now? If you need to count, start counting from today. Today's the day, okay, right? But you must receive the gospel. You must hear it. You must believe it. You must embrace it. Acts 16.30. <coughs> Uh, a jailer asked the apostles, Sir, what, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, there's the historical facts of the gospel, you will be saved. Every person, kids, 
kids, listen. Just because your mom and dad believe in Jesus, you don't receive the gospel just by hanging around mom and dad. Just because you come to church on Sunday, that doesn't mean that you believe the gospel. You, if you're born into the church or if you transfer in at a later time, have to come to a place where you understand who Jesus is and what he did for you on the cross and, raise, and being raised from the grave. You must believe it for yourself. It must be your faith. doesn't matter what your mom and dad believe or where you go to church or how many books you've read or if you've been nominated for Grammys for Best Contemporary Christian Music Album. What matters is if you have received the gospel. And in receiving the gospel, you receive Christ. And the Corinthians had done that. This should be a great encouragement to us if we've been pay paying attention all through the book of Corinthians. Do you know how screwed up some of these Corinthian Christians were? Do you know what kind of garbage and kind of sin they had it in their lives? Right? Like if you haven't been with us through this and you haven't read 1 Corinthians, let me tell you, whatever you're thinking of, it's, it's worse. It's worse. It's scandalous. And yet, even so, the Apostle Paul says, you guys heard the gospel I preached. You guys received it. You guys are standing in it. You guys are being saved by it. We must receive the gospel, but then we have to persevere in it. We have to stand in it, remain in it, receive it and remain in it, abide in it, hold fast to it, persevere in our faith in the gospel. This is really where my passion is as a pastor. Yeah, I want people who don't believe the gospel, who haven't heard the gospel, I want them to hear it and to understand it and to believe it and to be saved, but I want them to continue believing their whole life through. I want... I want you guys, I want to preach the gospel to you so that you guys believe it and that 20 years on you still believe it and 50 years on you still believe it. The gospel changes us if we stand in it and hold fast to it. Look at verses 9 through 11. The apostle Paul says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. He has a new humility that the gospel has created in him. There's a new hu humility for the Apostle Paul who previous to his conversion to Christ, previous to believing the gospel and receiving it, he was arrogant and violent. But now he says, I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. He has a new humility, he has a new identity, and now, through the proclamation of the gospel, he has a new purpose in his life. He abides in the gospel, which means he abides in Christ. And slowly, over time, God is making him more like Jesus in his character. And that's what God will do in us if we stand firm in the gospel over years, over decades, over a lifetime. This is the gospel that we've heard. This is the gospel that we believe. There's lots of reasons why a person might abandon their belief in the gospel. Disappointment with the church and with other Christians causes many people to abandon their belief in the gospel. But the gospel actually prepares us to be disappointed by each other. The scripture tells us all have sinned. We read the pages of 1 Corinthians and see how dysfunctional the Christian church has been since the very beginning. Even those who believe the gospel and, and, are, and are being saved, and are, are, that means, it means they're still in process and this work in us isn't finished yet. We see that sometimes God chooses to rescue us because we are the most screwed up and dysfunctional of all. And because our growth in holiness is a process and takes time. What I'm saying is that the church of Jesus Christ has always been a mixed bag of beauty and faithfulness and a new family and a holy holy temple that testifies to the veracity of the gospel and at the same time a crazy dumpster fire of remaining sin and selfishness and even while we object to what we see in the church are you and I that different and is God not still faithful to us 
Let's not confuse the cup for the contents. Sometimes people abandon the gospel because of sin in their own lives. A person might disappoint themselves so deeply with their behaviors, with their habits, with their sin, that it creates a cognitive dissonance for them, and something has to give. And sometimes the decision is made to jettison faith in the gospel rather than to jettison the sin which they've been choosing. The right response is to remember the gospel and to receive it anew, to stand in it, to hold fast, to remember that Jesus died to free us from those sins. Sometimes it's intellectual objections that haven't been adequately answered. Just know there's time to study and to explore and to search out answers and to refine our questions, and it's even okay to live with unanswered questions. God is looking for our trust in Christ, not our intellectual ability to explain everything. Thomas, one of the twelve, doubted that Jesus raised from the dead. The others believed and told him, and he would say, I won't believe it unless I see him myself. And Jesus appeared to him and said, see me yourself. Touch, touch my wounds. Right? Jesus was not angry that Thomas had doubts and objections, but he invited Thomas to explore. If you have intellectual doubts and objections to the gospel, Jesus is not offended. He invites you to explore and to put him to the test. But I think the thing that scares me the most for Christians is that lots of Christians abandon the gospel slowly over time as they let it drift away through simple neglect. Neglect of being involved in a Christian community. Neglect of spending time in God's word. Neglect of a life of prayer. And slowly over time, the distance between us and our faith in the gospel erodes until one day we realize we don't really believe this thing at all. The first Corinthians would say to us, hold fast. Don't let go. Stand firm in this belief. Make the gospel the main thing that your life is about. Let's pray. God, we pray that you would cause us to hold fast to the gospel. That you would encourage us to stand firm. God, we cannot hold to you as firmly as we should because we are weak. But God, you can hold fast to us. Nothing can take us out of your hand. Father, I pray that you would call us back to our first love that you would call us back to the gospel, which is of first importance, and that we might be people who stand firm and hold fast until we see you face to face. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.